Chapter Three of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Europe's oldest republic, in the capital of Switzerland, halfway between the borders of Germany and Italy, and only two hours by rail from where the League of Nations is sitting at Geneva. I write of how the Swiss govern themselves. During my stay in Bern, I have visited Parliament and talked with the members i have seen something of the bundesrat the council or cabinet that administers the country and have set across a plain table from the president of the republic and discussed with him the differences between his government and ours we pride ourselves on being the great republic of the world the swiss had established the independence of some of their cantons more than five hundred years before our republic was started it was two hundred years before columbus was born that william tell shot the apple off the head of his boy some of the authorities say that that story is not true but then many of them doubt even the bible at any rate in twelve ninety one the men of three forest districts formed an everlasting league for defence which was the foundation of the swiss confederation and along in the thirteen hundreds a thousand or so swiss leaguers defeated an austrian army of ten times their number and established a republican government it was after that battle that the name switzerland was applied to this mountain land but just what is switzerland and who are the swiss fancy yourself in an airplane that has just risen to the summit of mont blanc start there on the border of france and fly eastward to the new boundary of austria you have not traveled as far as from new york to boston yet you have crossed the country now fly to the northwest to Basel on the borders of Germany and then directly south to the borders of Italy. If you speed the machine, you can make that trip in an hour and 12 minutes. Looking down from the airplane, one is reminded of what a sailor of the days of Columbus said to the King of Spain in describing the island of Santo Domingo. He took up a sheet of notepaper, squeezed it in his fist and threw it, misshapen and wrinkled, upon the table saying your majesty santo domingo is like that this would be a good description of switzerland as seen from the air the land is all hills and hollows with snow-capped peaks gorges and canyons and here and there a plateau or a wide valley nevertheless the swiss have made the alps bloom like a garden a considerable portion of the country is still covered with forests as carefully looked after as the trees on your lawn another large part is pasture from which the stones have been picked so that the sweet grass grows among the big rocks while in the foothills and valleys are thousands of small farms and vineyards about one-third of the land is in cultivation the alps are here in two ranges with a stretch of tableland running between the juras and the higher alps from geneva to lake constance this strip which comprises about one-fifth of the country has a bed of rich soil and is intensely cultivated it is the backbone of swiss agriculture and includes the chief industrial and financial region here are most of the cities and hundreds of villages switzerland is a country of villages and has but few large centers the four leading municipalities are zurich and basel at the north Bern in the center and geneva at the west but these four towns together have not half as many people as has detroit and only two-thirds the population of boston the whole country is not quite twice the size of massachusetts and its total population numbers about the same as chicago's and now what of the inhabitants of this wonderful country like the americans they are a mixed people and that makes for strength switzerland's neighbors are germans on the north and east italians on the south and french on the west the swiss are a blending of these three stocks in geneva on the edge of france the common language is french on the north and east it is german and over the divide the popular tongue is that of italy almost everyone can speak french and german and many know italian as well one sees french and german signs over the stores and there are newspapers in all three languages the swiss are well educated everybody here can read and does read there are schools everywhere 
and the nation is known for its educational facilities people come from all over the world to attend swiss universities and to have their children taught german and french in the schools today there is absolute equality among the people who are the most democratic and independent in europe they have carried republicanism farther than we have and have ironed out many of the troubles with which we are still struggling as far as i can learn there is neither graft nor pork barrel in the conduct of the government and the swiss parliament is much more respected than our congress the whole nation takes an interest in public affairs and everyone goes to the polls the parliament is made up of men from all classes though most of the members are of moderate means and simple life Bern is one of the oldest quaintest and most charming little cities of europe founded when richard the lion-hearted of england was fighting the turks for the possession of jerusalem it was a free city before the magna carta was signed it was chosen as the seat of the swiss confederation at about the time of our mexican war and since then has been the home of all government activities except those of the supreme court which as a sop to french switzerland sits at lausanne Bern is only about one-fifth the size of washington but is far more picturesque the town is divided by the deep swift rushing air whose glacial waters roar as they tear their way on down toward the rhine magnificent bridges span the stream the capital and the president's palace are on a height right over the river they look toward the alps facing a half dozen mountains more than two miles in height after my talk with the president we walked out on the balcony in front of his office and his excellency pointed out the gigantic crest of the jungfrau and other snow-capped peaks that are known all over the world before entering the government buildings i strolled about through the business parts of the city i felt as if i had slipped back into the middle ages the narrow streets are walled with three and four-story buildings with overhanging tiled roofs out of which peep little dormer windows looking down like so many red-rimmed eyes on the traffic below some of the houses are so old that they lean this way and that and make one think of the drunken structures on the amsterdam piles here and there the arch of a tower curves over the highway in the most noted of the towers is a great clock dating from the sixteenth century when the hours strike a little door in the tower flies open and in the doorway a great rooster struts and crows while a troop of bears marches in procession around a figure supposed to represent time this clock has hands and figures plated with gold and its dial which is about twenty feet in diameter is decorated with frescoes i walked through the arch of the tower and under the clock into a mile or so of arcaded stores the pavements seem to be tunneled through the walls of the houses and are lined with stores the stores are like monastery cells looking out upon cloisters it is so dark in them that most of the shops have to burn electric lights throughout the whole day the arcades are about fifteen feet wide and in the oldest part of the town so low that one's head is not far from the ceiling now and then there are cross tunnels for the streets cutting through to the right and the left the whole forming a kind of catacomb quaint and delightful but not in accord with our ideas of business efficiency the chief government buildings are situated between these arcaded streets and the air on the high bluff over the river from the opposite bank of the stream they look like fortifications they were planned by swiss architects and built of sandstone from the quarries of Bern and marble from several cantons the wood is all native and the furnishings even to the great clock in the entrance hall were made in switzerland the clock which is the official timepiece of the republic is as big as a piano box and has a glass case that shows the works the swiss keep everything polished up to the nines and the assembly halls are scrubbed like so many dutch kitchens as i pass through on my way to see the president i noticed a gang of old women on their knees washing the tiles there were foot scrapers and foot wipers at the entrance and rugs for cleaning one's shoes at every door during my whole trip i saw no cuspidors such as one sees in every corner about the halls of our congress 
this afternoon i visited the assembly rooms and lingered a while in the lobbies which are walled with marble and have ceilings gorgeous with paintings and carvings the chamber of the national council is built in the shape of a half moon with the seats rising in concentric rows from the front to the back the president sits on a raised platform somewhat like our speaker's dais with a clerk on each side of him and the press gallery is at the front so that the members face the newspaper men as they speak a curious feature is the public translator speeches may be made in any one of three languages german french or italian the orders of the president are translated by the official interpreter and all his messages are furnished to the press in german and french the government reports are printed in german french and italian so that every citizen can read them the swiss republic is as free and democratic as ours but the machinery of administration is different the country is divided into twenty-two cantons or states which elect a national council and a state council the state council corresponds to our senate being composed of forty-four members two from each canton the national council is like our house of representatives it has one hundred and eighty-nine members chosen by direct vote at the rate of one for every twenty thousand of population in the confederation the two houses together are called the federal assembly clergymen are not eligible for election to either house general elections are held every three years on the last sunday in october and the voting is often done in the churches only men over twenty one have the right to vote for switzerland has not yet adopted suffrage for women each canton elects and pays two members of the state council in any way it may choose the geneva councillors get five dollars a day but the average salary of the others is four dollars some members get only three dollars the representatives of the lower houses are paid from the government treasury and get five dollars a day for the days they are present the legislative sessions are held four times a year as they usually last only two or three weeks a whole year's service seldom takes up as much as three months the members attend regularly their constituents object if they stay away if a representative in the national council cannot give a good reason for his absence he does not get his five dollars the meetings begin at eight in the morning in summer and at nine in the winter the executive authority of the swiss government is in the hands of the bundesrat or federal council whose seven members are elected by the federal assembly every three years these seven men have the fattest official jobs in the republic if five thousand dollars a year can be called fat they are like our cabinet members and each one is allotted a department the federal council elects the president of the republic who has a far different position from that of the president of the united states his term is for one year and his salary is fifty four hundred dollars he is really only the chairman of the council the vice president is also elected by the bundesrat and it is an unwritten law that he shall succeed the president neither president nor vice president may hold his office for two successive years the president with whom i talk today is carl schurr a citizen of Bern. he is a well-educated stout little man with a fair complexion and a scanty thatch of blond hair fringing the shiny baldness of his crown he was dressed in a business suit with a high wing collar and a black tie and wore large glasses with black rims behind which his blue eyes twinkled as he talked the room where we chatted was plainly furnished in a cabinet against one wall were models of rifles and cartridges used by switzerland to guard her neutrality during the world war and opposite this looking down upon the president's desk was an old photograph of abraham lincoln in the secretary's room adjoining i saw two portraits one of robert e lee and the other of william t sherman both painted in eighteen sixty nine by a swiss artist my conversation with the president covered a wide range we talked of the political parties of which the country has a half dozen or more including social democrats liberal democrats catholics agrarians and others when we touched on the tariff the president said that our high duties 
do much to hold down the production of swiss factories we spoke of the initiative and the referendum both of which he approves though not without some grains of salt the government of switzerland owns the railways and the telegraph and the telephones are under the post office department as usual in such cases the properties are extravagantly managed and last year the posts and the railways ran almost two million dollars behind republicanism goes farther here than with us every village and district is a little republic the communes into which the cantons or states are divided correspond somewhat to our counties townships and wards they are more than three thousand in number and settle almost every local question the people elect their own school teachers and policemen and have town meetings in which they decide upon all communal matters sometimes the meetings are held in the open air and the decisions are by acclamation some communes own property such as forest lands and houses and in these every family may be entitled to free pasture or free wood for the winter in the early morning and again at twilight one sometimes hears the concert of the cowbells as the cows owned by the various families of a village are being driven to or from the communal pastures in the mountains nearby. Once back in the village, every cow straightway seeks her own home without any urging. A few of the communes have grown rich from their forest, rents, lands, and houses. The privilege of citizenship in such communes is somewhat like membership in a prosperous stock company and if it is not inherited, it may be bought for a good round sum. On the other hand, it may prove less than a blessing, for each commune must pay its local expenses and take care of its own poor. End of chapter 3